So what I'm going to be doing for now, as uh, Christmas approaches, this is a time of year when people are thinking about the way that Jesus came into the world as one of us, that he put on flesh and became one of us. And so I wanted to look at several passages, uh, especially from the Old Testament, that kind of anticipated the Messiah and what it was that he was going to accomplish when he came. So we're going to be taking a few weeks to look at kind of an Old Testament lens on the person of Jesus leading up to his birth and his arrival here. Uh, So I've titled this series, God is Near, uh, which is, of course, one of the names of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. The earliest passage that we think could have some kind of messianic overtones to it would actually be Genesis chapter 2. I've got several verses selected. I don't want to read the whole chapter to you, but I want to read several key verses that have some good implications uh, for what it is that God really intended to do when he established this world. It says in Genesis 2 verse 4, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. Skipping to verse 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So we see that human beings, just the way that scripture is God breathed, we see what gives us life is the breath of God. We bear the image of God. We were created and made something special intentionally by God. But when you look at the things that God created, he made things that were pleasing to the eye, good for food. He envisioned a place where there would be peace and sustenance. In verse 15, it says the reason that the man was in the garden. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. He wasn't there merely to relax, but also to do something productive with his energy and his time to care for the creation. In verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now up to this point, any time God creates something and he gets to the end of a day, what does he say about his creation? It is good. This is the first thing God ever looked at and said was not good. It was a human being in total isolation. We're meant to have relationships and connections. He says it's not good for this person just to be purely alone. In verse 22, then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. There's this picture of total connection and openness, no sense of shame involved. So I've run through those verses quickly, but if you were to look at Genesis chapter 2 and say, as God was making a place for us, what did he really want the world to be like in our experience? I think you could say that God certainly wanted it to be a place of peace, that there would be beauty to look at. And don't we still enjoy creation? Don't you always feel closer to God when perhaps you go to the hill country or you go to the ocean? And there's so many things you can look at. And just looking at the creation helps us feel connected to the creator. He wanted it to be a place of peace through beauty, but also that we would have sustenance, that we would have things to take care of us and provide for us. He wants the world to be a place of shared connections, that it's not good for us to try to do life in isolation, but those connections are important. He envisioned the world to be a place of openness without shame. And isn't it the case that so many people in the world wear masks as we go about our days? We want to present a version of ourselves. It's fascinating to me what you can do with social media and filters now where it doesn't even matter what you look like. You can tell the app to put a whole different face on you, right? And you can add dog ears or whatever else you want to do. But, you know, we're always presenting versions of ourselves, But God wanted us to actually be so comfortable in our own skin that, that we could really be open with people and not feel shame. You also see the value of work expected, that we would do things with our energy and our talents that led to good fruit, things that we could feel good about doing. Now that was God's vision for what he wanted that garden to be like. But the serpent, the Satan figure here, has a very different set of agenda items, does he not? So what did Satan want out of the garden? 
He wanted it to become a place of darkness and unrest, a place where you couldn't ever feel at peace no matter where you went. He wanted it to be a place of severed relationships. I've always loved the way that when God walks into the garden and he's looking for Adam and Eve, he doesn't start by making this grand introduction the way that an angel might later and have to say, I'm the Lord your God who now speaks to you. All he says is just like when you get home from work and you say, hey, where is everybody? He just shows up in the garden and says, where are you? That, that's such a close communicative relationship that they had intact. But Satan wants to see our relationships severed. He wants to see us live from a place of shame and hiding, that I'm always afraid to be my true self because I am ashamed of myself. He wants us to live our lives as a, as a series of very stale actions, things that don't lead to anything productive or good, that we would only do things that are self-interested or perhaps even destructive. That's Satan's vision for what the world would be like. So, of course, you remember the serpent shows up in this story and it encourages Eve to eat that fruit that had been forbidden and he convinces her to take from it, so she does, and then she gives it to Adam, who, by the way, it says was standing there with her, and he eats from it also with her eyes are opened, and then from that point on, everything is different. So we have this passage David read for us. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You'll crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And here's where it starts taking on a messianic overtone, like it's talking about the Messiah. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So even though the serpent and those who are of the serpent would attack the descendant of this woman. The serpent will strike, but the offspring will prevail. Ultimately, Jesus would prevail over the power of sin and death and the devil. As I think about this story of the serpent in the garden and the way that God is responding to what's ultimately going to happen to the serpent, I can't help but think, I went home for Thanksgiving, I can't help but think about this story we always like to tell when we get my family back together about mom versus the snake. I don't know if you have one of those stories in your family, but uh, when I was little, we had kind of a playground area in our backyard where my sister and I were all the time, and occasionally we would get some snakes uh, near our equipment. But there was one time in particular where we saw the snake, my sister and I saw it, we screamed, we started running, and even though truthfully I think it was a fairly harmless snake, it wasn't a rattlesnake, I think it was just a typical garden snake, but my mom came running and she went and got the hoe. And she ran over to that snake and she chopped it in half. But then both halves kept wiggling. And so then she chopped each of those halves in half, but then there were still little pieces that were wiggling. And so as long as she saw any part wiggling, she kept chopping until eventually there is no part of this snake left longer than about a tater tot. I mean, she, <laughs> she made very clear there, are, there is no snake welcome to be present in the area where her children are playing. But this is the ultimate destiny for Satan and those who live according to his ways, that they are not welcome to be present among the children of God, that God doesn't want his influence, he doesn't want his deception, and all the things that Satan is working for in the world are going to be crushed, they're going to be extinguished, they're going to be put behind us. And so I wanted to reference this story. This is kind of the earliest picture of what Jesus would eventually accomplish. I wanted to look at a few different ways that the New Testament writers refer back to this passage. So when they think about what it is that Jesus did, this is a passage that stayed in their memory and in their mind as they talked about what he accomplished. So I'm going to look briefly at three passages uh, that do this. First uh, is Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. It says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. The power of death, the power of the devil over us, the fear that people live out of, Jesus came to crush that under his feet, to break that power. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful 
and faithful high priest. I think that word order is interesting, that he would be faithful to God, but first it mentions how he would be a merciful high priest for us. He came down to undo the effects of the devil because he wants to show mercy on us, even as he shows faithfulness to God. uh, That he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So what they say in Hebrews is they look at this story of what Jesus is supposed to do in stomping out the darkness and the effects of sin and death is that Jesus would come and he would become like us, that God would draw near to us so that he could provide us with a way out, that we could be delivered from those things. A verse that we sometimes will talk about uh, is 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. And unfortunately, sometimes I think this verse gets misused a bit. Uh, It says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Now, it's important to notice, I sometimes will hear Christians say to people, God will never give you more than you can handle. And I want to say, Scripture never says that. And this is usually the verse they reference when they make that claim. And if you'll notice, this is not at all what that verse says. In fact, merely the fact that you're going to die, each of us is going to die, tells us there's going to be something you experience in this life eventually that you can't handle. The problem of our sinfulness, the problem of our corruption, these are all things, the whole reason we're Christians is because we acknowledge that I need help with this, that I couldn't do this on my own. So it's not the case that God doesn't let you experience more than you can handle. What it says is that God is going to provide us with help, specifically in time of temptation. He says, if you make your mind up that you want to resist the devil, that you don't want to let him have hold of your life, claim over your actions, it says, if you resist the devil, if you resist temptation, the promise here in scripture is that when you're tempted, God will provide a way out. So here's a challenge for you. In your life, whatever temptation is coming your way, I want to challenge you to look for a way out. Because I really believe this is a promise of scripture that if you're looking for a way out of temptation, God will provide a way out of that temptation. Now, sometimes maybe you're going to do something you shouldn't and someone randomly that you know just walks up and distracts you. Maybe you get a random text message on your phone that distracts you from what you would have done otherwise. Um, Maybe sometimes you, you, you miss an appointment or something that should have happened and you have to go somewhere else. But I really believe that God, if we want to resist temptations, and again, I challenge you to look for this in your life. If you're looking for a way out, God always provides some way out so that you can honor him in your life. So one of the ways that God helps us stomp out this darkness, the way that Jesus would, is by providing us with a way out. We can get out from under the guilt of sin, but also we can resist temptation because of the help that he provides. A second passage that references this story in Genesis is 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. It says, Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. There's that reference. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning, because they've been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. So one of the ways that Satan is active and at work in the world is by trying to keep negative cycles in place. As we talked in that last passage about being kind of crippled by fear, things that make us afraid, Satan wants you to make bad decisions, but he also wants you to believe that you have no choice but to persist in those decisions, that whatever mistake you've made, that should always hang over you. Whatever bad habit you formed, you must always continue to do. But one of the things that Jesus came to do is to destroy the work of the devil, specifically to break those negative cycles. 
He wants us to see that we really can start doing what is right, that mistakes of the past don't have to determine everything about the trajectory of our future, that just because we've sinned, it doesn't mean we have to live as people always entrapped by sin. So a song I think I've referenced to you before that I think captures this idea well of being kind of stuck in this place. You remember Tennessee Ernie Ford? It came a long, long, long time before I was born. But Tennessee Ernie Ford had this song called 16 Tons. The song is about having to work a really rough job, having a rough life as a poor person where you didn't have many options. And one of the things he's talking about is someone who's kind of stuck living in a company town. Now, the church that I worked at before I moved here in Old Hickory, Tennessee, Old Hickory was a company town. It was all owned by the DuPont Company. And so in ideal situations, the company would, would treat you fairly. If it's a company town, it meant you work for DuPont. DuPont owned your house. DuPont owned the store where you shopped. DuPont hired the doctor who helped your family. And in some cases, these company towns did treat their people reasonably well. But there were occasions that they became like a form of modern slavery, where because the company owned every aspect of your life, including what salary they give you. They wouldn't give you enough salary knowing how much you'd have to buy. And it's like the longer you work, the more you are indebted to the company store. So this is, this is what he references here. He says, you load 16 tons. What do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me because I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. And that's for some of y'all that'll be in your head the rest of the day, I imagine. But it's a bleak picture, isn't it? And this is the mindset that Satan wants us to live out of. Every day, I'm a day older, I'm closer to death, and I'm even less prepared to face it. It's just this negative, it's such a bleak picture, this downward spiral that my soul is already claimed and everything I do is moving downward. But in the person of Jesus Christ, the devil's work has been broken. He's provided us with a way out. He continues to provide us with ways out. He's broken that cycle of sin and death, and we don't have to live into that cycle anymore. A third passage that builds on this story in Genesis is Romans chapter 16. I really love uh, this verse uh, 19. It says, everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. There's that reference. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. I love those two items, the way he puts them together. Be wise about what is good and be innocent about what is evil. So another way to put that would be, you know, like in your life, what are the things that you know a lot about? Do you spend your time thinking so much about good things, noble things, pure things, that you really get to know a lot about what they are, what good is in the world, what good you can accomplish in the people's lives around you? Do you focus in being wise about what is good, but what about the things that are evil? It's better to be blissfully ignorant of a lot of the terrible things that happen in the world, or specifically how you go about doing those things. What is, that we, what is it that we try to stay willfully ignorant about, that I don't even want to go down that path so that that path of evil is an unfamiliar road to me? He says, the more we absorb ourselves in doing good and abstaining from evil, he says, it's almost like we suddenly discover that God is crushing Satan under our feet because we're so focused on higher things. Something to be said about what it is that we focus on. I'm sure a lot of you have read uh, the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. Uh, it was a, it's a profound idea. He, Lewis decided to write this series of letters from a senior demon to his nephew. So there's a senior demon named Screw Tape, and he's got a nephew named Wormwood who's considered a junior tempter. And so he's mentoring this junior demon in how to make sure this particular Christ, this particular person doesn't become a Christian and receives uh, damnation. So the goal is to see this person be lost, and it's a conversation between demons trying to work to see this person be lost. The, the letters are just fascinating, and they're insightful, but the thing about it was they were enormously popular, and everybody wanted C.S. Lewis just to continue writing more and more of these because they were just so insightful and interesting. But C.S. Lewis stopped writing these not because they weren't popular, but because he didn't like having to try and put him on his own self in the mindset of what demons think like. He said, the more I reflect on this and what demons are up to and how they think, it was negatively affecting my own soul. And he said, I would rather become wiser about things that are good. I'd rather focus on the good as opposed to living with my mind always trapped in those kinds of thoughts. 
So it wasn't the popularity of the work that stopped it. It was actually Lewis's own soul work that he just couldn't bear the weight of only thinking about evil so much in his life. So as we reflect on God drawing near, Jesus being born into the world, um, God has drawn near in the person of Jesus Christ. He's provided us with a way out. He's broken the cycle. He's promised to crush Satan under our feet when we're always growing in our experience of him and our knowledge of what is good. So we have to work at stomping out the darkness in our life. And I would point us again back to Genesis 2 in this portrait of what the world is supposed to be like for the children of God. How do we move more toward Genesis 2 in our own lives? It would involve us moving toward peace. What is it in your life that is taking your peace away? What is it that's making you feel more stressed, more chaotic, more unworthy? I think God's voice would call us to move away from those things and to move toward things that help us to truly be at peace. God would have us move towards connections. Who are the people in your life that you haven't been making enough time for? Who are the people that really could use your encouragement? The people you could be praying for, as we talked about this morning. The people who need you to be present. Look for connections. Move toward those connections. What about openness? Are you living in such a way that you don't have to be hidden about parts of your life, that you can simply be yourself and be increasingly comfortable in your own skin? to be an undivided person, to be an uncomplicated person, to be a person who lives your life purely for one thing and you let that one thing trickle down into all the other areas of your life where you make choices? What about the purpose of your actions? Are you living in such a way that your life is accomplishing things you'll be proud of, not just immediately, but in the long haul? Things you could stand before God and say, I'm glad that I did that and I did that for you. For whose benefit are the actions that you take in your life? There's a lot of things for us to be thinking about, but the clear image of what Jesus is supposed to be doing is that in our life, Jesus should be stomping out the darkness, crushing it under his feet so that we can be liberated, so that we can be more joyful, better people.